On this edition of the CBS Video Library of World War II, we will look at the men around Hitler, those who served him and those who tried to kill him. From among Hitler's inner circle, we will portray a man who was once one of the Fuhrer's favorites and ended a scapegoat, Hermann Goering. In a chapter entitled Minister of Hate, we will look at the career of Joseph Goebbels, the wily impresario who orchestrated the awesome spectacles of the Third Reich. The many bizarre twists and turns in the strange case of Rudolf Hess will be the subject of another chapter. And from the ranks of Hitler's enemies from within his Reich, we will meet some who risk their lives to rid Germany and the world of Adolf Hitler. We begin with a profile of a man some called a buffoon, a buccaneer, a playboy. Others saw him as a shrewd politician, a great diplomat. All might agree, however, that he was ruthless, vain, greedy. This is the story of Hermann Wilhelm Goering. During World War I, young Prussian career officer Hermann Goering is a leading ace in the German Air Force. In 1918, he succeeds Baron von Richthofen as commander of the famous Flying Circus. But there will be no place for combat heroes in a defeated Germany. And he will say to comrades, we must prepare. We must wish for another struggle. Untrained except for war, Goering becomes a stunt pilot in Scandinavia. In Sweden, at Rockelstad Castle, he meets the unhappily married Karen von Kantsoff, a lady who believes devoutly in Nordic racial supremacy. She divorces her husband to marry Goering, and they return to the Germany he now calls the Jew Republic to seek his destiny. Meeting Adolf Hitler, Goering says, from the first moment, I belong to him body and soul. And Hitler makes him chief of his unruly stormtroops. Wounded in Hitler's 1923 strike for power, Goering goes into exile, is treated in these Swedish institutions for mental illness and drug addiction. By 1926, Goering has returned to Germany to take up his political activities. The number of Nazis has increased in his absence. In the welter of German political parties, Hitler attracts most of his followers from the lower middle classes, who are ruined in the catastrophic inflation of 1923. Goering calls the mobs a master race, promises them supremacy through national socialism under the leader, he equates patriotism with violence and hatred of all who oppose Adolf Hitler. By 1931, the Nazi party is the second largest in the Reich, and Goering is second only to Hitler himself. The Nazi private army parades its power, challenging all opponents in the streets. The world depression has hit bottom, Six million Germans are out of work, and as chaos grows from disorder, the Nazis will win, not only by force, but at the polls. In 1932, the Nazis enter the parliament as Germany's strongest party to elect Goering president of the Reichstag, but not till the following year, through treachery and conspiracy, will the Nazis gain total control. In power at last, Goering sets up his secret police, the Gestapo, and says, I know only two sorts of men those with me and those against. A bullet fired from a police pistol is my bullet. If that is murder, then I am a murderer. Germany's Republic is consumed in the flames that burn the Reichstag to the ground on February 27, 1933. Goering himself is suspected of setting the fire the Nazis use as pretext to suspend all civil liberties. He orders stormtroops and Gestapo into action, tells them, better shoot the wrong man than not shoot at all. From that night on, no one in Germany is safe from the knock on the door. delights in prestige and wealth, names his feudal hunting lodge, Kerenhall, in memory of his Swedish wife, who died too soon to share his triumphs. He is a sportsman whose principles will not permit him to slay a tame deer. But about another quarry, human beings, he says, I am not in office to dispense justice, but to destroy and exterminate. Open season is declared on 1% of the population, 
the Jews. Goering's brilliant air chief, Erhard Milk, is part Jewish, but Goering's job is to build a new German air force. Says Goering, I decide who is Aryan. Behind such innocent activities as model classes, air sports associations, and boys' glider clubs, the secret air force, forbidden by the Versailles Treaty, grows. In 1935, the secret is out. The mighty Luftwaffe flies for the world to see. Hitler gives Goering full credit for his formidable achievement. National observers make no protest as Goering now diplomatically claims for Germany only equality in the air. But he dreams of supremacy. Today, Germany, tomorrow, the world. When Hermann Goering marries Emmy Zonemann, a leading German actress in 1935, Nazi Germany is provided with a first class circus. Street side standing room has been sold at $8.50 per person. The receipts, totaling $200,000, will go to the newlyweds. To the people, he is Unser Hermann, our Hermann, who loves display and dressing up for them in his fabulous 50 uniforms. Hitler sends his invaluable showman off on a statesman's honeymoon around the capitals of Europe. No other Nazi is so welcome outside the Reich, can so charm rulers and diplomats into accepting him as a friend. To millions of hungry Germans, he is benevolent, lovable Uncle Hermann, publicly soliciting money for their aid, entertaining their children at Christmas time. Spain, 1936. It is the Spanish Civil War. Aiding Franco, Goering puts his Luftwaffe to its first test, sends the Condor Legion to give the world, as he puts it, a practical demonstration of aerial warfare. Goering is made economic dictator, introduces a four-year plan so that Germany may take her rightful place in the sun. Meine lieben deutschen Volksgenossen und Volksgenossinnen, meine lieben Kampfkameraden, der Sinn meiner National Socialists, men and women, my dear comrades in battle, dass der Führer mir mich beauftragt hat. The Führer gave me orders to organize all potentials, to unify our strength to our one and single goal. The main thing is that the great mass of our people get enough food so that they are strong enough to work. I take the responsibility for that. I guarantee that I will accomplish it. To fulfill the plan, stockholders and owners will have their profits cut down. Laborers will work 16 hours a day without overtime. Goering, using public funds, buys and builds an industrial empire for himself. Blankets his holdings under the name of the Hermann Goering Works. To many thrifty, hard-working Germans, Goering's gusto and greed, his opulence and power, personify enjoyment of the future paradise Hitler has promised a victorious Germany. He diverts 50% of all national resources to military ends, puts into production 18,000 first-line planes. He tells Hitler he will train thousands of pilots, turn them loose, and depend on the survival of the fittest. Success in Spain has convinced the Nazis that the Luftwaffe will win over Europe by intimidation or conquest. Just after the Munich crisis, baby Edda Goering is christened. Her godfather is Adolf Hitler.
Munich victory cements the facade of Nazi unity. Joseph Goebbels, number three in Hitler's hierarchy, congratulates Goering on his 46th birthday. It is 1939. Goering holds Germany's highest military rank of field marshal, and gifts pour into him as tributes from admiring friends and enemies alike. His Luftwaffe waits, full strength and ready, for his order to proceed with the invasion of Poland. Says Goering, Germany will no longer need any Munichs to lay down the law. First target, Warsaw. Goering is at the summit of his career. Now Goering makes his greatest promise. His invincible Luftwaffe will vanquish England. He boasts to the cheering multitudes, if an enemy bomber ever reaches Germany, my name is not Hermann Goering. You can call me Meyer. The invasion of Britain, Operation Sea Lion, waits for the Luftwaffe to destroy the Royal Air Force. A minor raid on Berlin, which infuriates Hitler, gives Goering his excuse to overrule the generals. He orders an assault on London to continue day and night until the RAF has destroyed itself, until the people's will to resist is broken. The Luftwaffe hears that its objective is no longer to obliterate British airfields one by one, but all out attack on the huge, vulnerable city of London. Emmy Goering celebrates her 47th birthday. Take off for London, but while its air bases have been free from raids, the RAF has been able to regroup, rebuild for the defense of Britain. After day, the RAF breaks up its formations, scatters, pursues, takes mortal toll of German planes, until Goering cries, how long can they hold out? How long can we go on? In Paris, Goering seeks escape from failure, from his responsibilities, from Hitler's terrible displeasure. At the Ritz Hotel, he lives with the pomp and circumstance of a royal conqueror, but has few friends. He knows that his powerful Nazi compatriots are his antagonists, waiting only for his downfall. Back on drugs again for his nerves, he throws himself into choosing the best from the loot of a continent. Takes back home to Karen Hall a staggering $200 million worth of art treasures. Hitler calls him that weakling, surrounded by his family of women, wallowing in his domestic luxury. Targets for the RAF, Berlin, Bremen, 
cologne, Essen. The myth of invincible Luftwaffe protection explodes. The German people fleeing nightly to shelters remember Goering's boast and bitterly call him Herr Meyer. It will be a long time before the war reaches Germany on the ground, but by the end of 1943, the Allied air forces carry destruction over the whole of Hitler's Reich. And the Fuhrer, in need of a scapegoat, blames one man, his fat, sick Reichsmarshal Hermann Goering. Goering is kept as a figurehead, excluded from most high-level conferences and ignored by the generals. When not at home hiding from the war, he spends his idle time with his fighter pilots, personally decorating them for heroic exploits, remembering his own much decorated youth, exchanging combat stories. Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels, now number two man under the leader, tours the wrecked city and refers to Goring when he speaks of those prominent personalities who still lead a life of idle luxury while the people are suffering. By May of 1945, the heroes and the scapegoats of the Third Reich are all one to the German army and to the German people who replaced the swastika with a symbol of total surrender. On May 8, 1945, Hermann Göring is taken prisoner. Until this moment, he still expects to treat with the Western powers as the highest ranking German official. There are tidy ironies in Göring's descent from power to prison. He has tried to take over as Hitler's legal successor when Hitler, in beleaguered Berlin, could no longer exercise control of the Reich, only to have Hitler order him arrested by the Nazi police. He has escaped the Nazis, only to be picked up by a small American search party. He will spend the night guarded by Lieutenant Jerome Shapiro of New York City. Regaining a measure of his bravado, he tells the American soldiers, death is the fate of the defeat. Prisoner Goering holds a news interview. This key witness to 25 years of German political life readily answers questions, prophesies a black future for the world, and ends by thanking the German people who stood by their guns, even though they knew the end was hopeless. At Nuremberg, Goering is tried for crimes against peace and humanity, concerned only with his patriotic rehabilitation in Germany, protesting ignorance of hideous atrocities, but not innocence. He is found by Allied prosecutors to be a shrewd adversary, an astute and clever witness. Examining psychiatrists say of him, he has egotism without ethics. Then on October 1st, 1946, he hears the verdict of the court. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Two hours before he is to hang, he will commit suicide in his cell. Hermann Goering will be cremated at the European Theater Mortuary, 10 miles from the concentration camp at Dachau. We will focus a closer look now on the man who replaced Goering as the number two man to Adolf Hitler. He was, above all, a super salesman and a super showman. The product he sold was Hitler. How well he succeeded is part of our story on Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Hate. In January 1933, the super salesman with the limp Joseph Goebbels helps catapult Adolf Hitler and the Nazis into power in Germany. His reward? The Ministry of Propaganda. His objective? The minds and souls of 80 million Germans. A hypnotic speaker, every word, every rehearsed gesture is coldly calculated to hit its mark. Propaganda is an art, best achieved by genius, Goebbels has written. From the first, this genius has been used to project the myth of Hitler, the God. 
the creative instrument of fate and deity, Goebbels calls him. For both Hitler and Goebbels, words are weapons. The voice, the instrument by which unthinking emotion must be generated in the masses. Of his first encounter with the impassioned voice of Adolf Hitler, Goebbels reports, I didn't know what was happening. It was as though guns were thundering. I was beside myself. Then for a moment, the man up there looked at me. His blue eyes met my glance like a flame. This was a command. At that moment, I was reborn. Now I knew which road to take. And with him now, on that road, the road to ruin, the mass of German people. The prestige of Adolf Hitler, Goebbels knows, is the measure of his own power. A physical weakling, little more than five feet tall, a victim of polio in his childhood, rejected by the army in World War I. Goebbels now compensates for a life of poverty and failure. Failure as a dramatist, novelist, and journalist. I have learned to despise the human being from the bottom of my soul, he has said. The Nazi movement gives him an instrument for his frustrated talents, an outlet for his fierce hatreds and anti-Semitism. A government such as ours has to take far-reaching measures, he says. I am determined to work on the masses until they fall to us. In May 1933, Goebbels, proclaiming the end of Jewish intellectualism, orders the burning of all books considered hostile to the Nazi regime. Among the flames, the works of the poet Heinrich Heine, who had written, wherever they burn books, they will burn human beings also. Now the prophecy comes true. Dachau, Buchenwald, Mauthausen, the concentration camps become the secret crematoria of a stricken people, the Jews joined by any who dare doubt the theory of a German master race. Publicly, Goebbels calls the existence of the camps a stinking lie. But privately, he says, the Jews are our misfortune. We must hasten this process with cold ruthlessness. In full view for all to see, parades, pageantry, propaganda. Hitler has written, the task of propaganda is to attract followers. And Goebbels spellbinds the German people with his stagecraft with Wagnerian-like spectacles calculated to inflame their emotions and confuse their minds. The masses are uninformed stuff. We must appeal to their primitive instincts, says Joseph Goebbels, the master showman in the wings. At the center of the stage, Goebbels star Adolf Hitler the deity who will make Germany great again, the divine leader who will protect them, Goebbels says, from the annihilation that threatens from every side. The image of Hitler's infallibility, successfully projected by Goebbels, inflated and dispersed by the camera, becomes a reality for the German people. This is where the Nazi power lies. Goebbels reaps his harvest. Cheers for Austria, death by Anschluss. Cheers for Czechoslovakia, occupied. Minds molded, wills subjected, they are ready for war. War is the inevitable climax to Goebbels' propaganda. And in 1939, his propaganda follows the soldiers to war. More than a million dollars a day are spent on propaganda. For Goebbels, the shooting war is no more important than the propaganda war. Radio, the Deutsche Rundfunk, is his number one weapon, originally utilized to direct public opinion, as well as to distract the German populace. Now Nazi propaganda is also transmitted all over the world in 27 languages. 14 Uhr und eine Minute, der Wehrmachtbericht. Führer Hauptquartier, das Oberkommando der Wehrmacht gibt bekannt. Aus dem Hofquartier von einem Führer Maakt het oppercommando der Wehrmacht het volgende bekend. Today's official German war communique reads as follows. 
در فرماندهی ارتش آلمان از ستاد پیشوای آلمان آگهی می دهد که آلمان اردوبر بشت کماندان لونون رسمی دهد When Goebbels speaks to the German people, who are strictly forbidden to listen to foreign broadcasts, radio wardens see that they listen. Das Reich steht, die Nation ist unerschütterlich, das ganze Volk geheim und geschlossen wie die Sieg heil! Sieg heil! Sieg heil! Goebbels recognizes the tremendous propaganda potential in films. He enjoys supervising every aspect of motion picture production. The writing, casting, and editing of films like the anti-British Ohm Kruger, which grossly caricatures British imperialism during the Boer War. The newsreel, the Deutsche Wohenschau, is made strictly for propaganda. A multitude of cameramen record the surrender of France in June 1940. This is Goebbels' big show, at the same spot in the forest of Compiègne where the Germans suffered the humiliation of surrender in 1918. In the same railway coach, he stages the French surrender. As an extra touch, Goebbels orders the railway car brought to Berlin for all to see. The solid proof of Nazi invincibility. The tools of triumph are displayed. The weapons of victory become toys for the children of the conquerors. home front, Goebbels directs a celebration of German might, proclaiming the tide has turned, the war is won. But before long, this taste of victory will sour, and his words will turn to dust. It is 1943. Allied bombers are penetrating deeper and deeper into Germany. They soon carry destruction over all of Hitler's right. As disaster mounts upon disaster, one strident voice is heard in the land, preaching victory, crying revenge. The actor's voice of Joseph Goebbels. We look to the Fuhrer to gain strength from his strength. The German people will fight. They will fight in every way, and at the end of the struggle, there will be victory. Our enemies may not believe this, but we will prove it to them. The wail of death and destruction is drowned by the voice of vengeance. Gottesdienst, 
We go into battle as though in God's service with our obedient children and faithful wives before our eyes. We cry revenge for our violated earth for which our enemies will perish. Goebbels, to build up his popularity, constantly visits the devastated areas. The number two man of the Third Reich, Hermann Goering, had promised the people that no enemy bomb would ever fall on Germany. Goebbels, who has always hated Goering, blames him for the people's plight and realizes his life's ambition by becoming second only to Hitler in the eyes of the German people. Total war, Goebbels calls for it and demands every sacrifice. The British say you don't want total war. They say you want surrender. Do you want total war? I ask you, are you determined to fight for victory? Are you determined to follow the Fuhrer through thick and thin? Are you willing to make the greatest personal sacrifice? homeless nation, Goebbels says, as long as there are people left to defend the fatherland, military defeats mean nothing. April 20th, 1944. It is Hitler's birthday, and Goebbels brings the people out in celebration amid the ruins. Goebbels finds glory in disaster, makes a fetish of defeat. Although no longer do huge, frantic crowds line the sidewalks, Goebbels tries to exploit this event in one of his last propaganda newsreels. Germany is not being defeated, his propaganda says. It is merely defending its victory. But despite all the honeyed, mixed-up words, the false heroics, the empty gestures, the calculated lies, the German people now face a hard reality no propaganda can diminish, falsify, or erase. We will fight to our last breath rather than allow the enemy to occupy German land. Das wird der Feind in den nächsten Wochen und Monaten zu verspüren bekommen. Dass es etwas anderes ist, Paris und Bukarest. Our enemy will learn that it is one thing to take Paris or Bucharest, something else to capture Cologne or Königsberg. In April 1945, as the Russians are approaching Berlin, Goebbels, the city's defender, orders an army of old men and children to fight to the finish. If victory cannot be attained, nothing is to survive. Joseph Goebbels, his wife and six children, hide in Hitler's bomb-proof bunker. But his directives remain. Berlin remains German. Capitulate? No. Barricades up, the Russian siege of Berlin begins.
Russian beleaguered Berlin, Hitler and his newly taken wife, Eva Braun, prepare to commit suicide. The final role of the Minister of Hate, Joseph Goebbels, is told now by H.R. Trevor Roper, author of The Last Days of Hitler. Uh, he really stage managed the whole thing. Uh, it was he who persuaded Hitler uh, to stay on. His propaganda was confined by this time to Hitler. Uh, uh, and he convinced Hitler that the right thing to do was to stay on and to commit suicide. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we know that in the end of March, uh, Goebbels was already talking about a final Twilight of the Gods scene, uh, which he was managing. There's no doubt that he managed the whole thing. And he considered that this was his last piece of propaganda which would create a kind of heroic myth, uh, which would be so much better than a disorderly disintegration of the regime. And after that, uh, Goebbels and Bormann, who remained behind, attempted uh, to make contact with the Russian commander and make a truce, and failing, uh, they adopted, uh, they went their different ways. That is to say, uh, Go Goebbels stayed behind, uh, killed all his children, six children, uh, and then he and his wife uh, committed suicide, and the Russians closed in. Goering, Goebbels, and now a look at the third, and in many ways, perhaps strangest, of the men gathered about Adolf Hitler. His name, Rudolf Hess. His story, one of the most bizarre of World War II. We began when Hess was Hitler's loyal henchman, the number three man in the Third Reich. Rudolf Hess in the 1930s is Adolf Hitler's deputy. He is chief of the Nazi party. Hitler's alter ego, his most devout, his rapturous disciple. To Hess, Hitler is truly Germany. Germany is truly Hitler. Die Partei ist Hitler. Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist. Hitler, Sieg! Sieg! Hess is intense, intelligent, contradictory. He is a zealous practitioner of the muscular credo of Nordic superiority. He is a food faddist and hypochondriac. But in the beer hall days of the Nazi rise, he is a street fighter, a political kidnapper, Hitler's bodyguard. Officer Hess meets Corporal Hitler in World War I, is an early Nazi. In 1923, he is jailed with Hitler. The university-educated Hess helped shape the wild outpourings of his idol into a book called Mein Kampf. Among the twisted Nazis, Hess seems stable and clean-cut. To Germans, he is the perfect Nazi image. Yet in 1940, Hess seems almost a figurehead with no military role. While he collects for charity, the conquests he dreamed of with Hitler are being won. While he exhorts civilians, Hermann Goering of the Luftwaffe supplants him as Hitler's heir. A fanatical anti-communist, Hess is heartbroken at Hitler's cynical pact with Stalin. Yet he fears a two-front war and is disturbed by visions of English children bombed by Germany's growing air fleet. Like Hitler, he dreams that Nordic England should be Nordic Germany's ally. Out of fear, disappointment, dream, comes a plan. He, Rudolf Hess, will take one of these planes, fly to Britain, talk with the king, and save Germany. Save Hitler. CBS News correspondent Daniel Shore. This is where Rudolf Hess practiced for his flight the Messerschmitt factory's airstrip in Augsburg, Germany. Hess, a former flying officer, the rival of the World War I ace Hermann Goering, as the Nazis' leading air expert, is permitted by his friend Willy Messerschmitt to make some 20 flights in the newly developed Messerschmitt 110. 
a twin-engine, two-seater plane developed in that Messerschmitt factory behind me. It is this plane which will carry Hess on his fateful mission to Scotland. Carl Heinz Pinch, Hess's adjutant, tells the story. On January 10th, 1941, Hess takes off, leaving a letter to be opened if he does not return in three hours. The hours pass. Pinch reads the letter. It tells of Hess's plan to fly to Britain. Then Hess does return, mechanical trouble. Pinch and others sworn to silence keep the incredible secret from the Nazi command for four months. May 10th, Hess has a new, hard-to-get leather flying suit. At home, he has had an unusually long visit with his three-year-old son. Today is the day of his mission. He goes, he says, at the unexpressed wish of his Führer, Messerschmitt test pilot Helmut Kaden. I was probably among the last to say goodbye to Rudolf Hess. The proof is in this picture. You see me, you see Hess, you see the plane. The tanks were filled, the plane was checked out. Hess contacted the weather station in Hamburg and prepared his flight plan, which didn't make much sense to us. The plane took off perfectly. No pilot could have handled the Messerschmitt 110 aircraft any better. Then Hess's adjutants got together in my office and sat around my desk. We waited to see if Hess would come back, but nothing happened. It grew dark, night came along, then one adjutant put his hand in his pocket and took out a sealed envelope. He said, now I have an important duty. I have to carry this letter to the Fuhrer. Hess speeds north. A radio station plays a popular song over and over, a Hess request. He uses it now for navigation. In Berlin, the letter Hess's adjutant has delivered makes Hitler scream and diplomatic channels crackle. In Italy, Mussolini fears Hitler is betraying him. In Moscow, Stalin is certain Hitler is plotting with Winston Churchill. Joseph Goebbels writes, Hess brought us close to ruin with our allies. Hess's family, Pinch, Messerschmitt, Cardin, others are arrested. Hess is mad, Hitler tells the German people, to whom military conquest has so far brought only hardship. Now their perfect Nazi is gone. A Berlin taxi driver sums up a common feeling. We will win and win and win, he mutters, until we lose. Hess has memorized his route to Scotland thoroughly. North toward Norway, west, then south. I could have flown it in my sleep, he says. He hedge hops with great pleasure. He climbs, and as he shows in the sketch he made later for his son, parachutes. He lands just 12 miles from the home of the astonished man he hopes to see first, the Duke of Hamilton. The landing spot. The British welcome the new ME-110 as a first-rate intelligence find. Hess will insist on seeing the Duke of Hamilton because he believes only Churchill and his war party want to continue the war. If the Duke, whom Hess has seen competing in the Berlin Olympics in 1936, will take him to the king, Hess feels Churchill can be foiled. The first man he does see is David McLean and McLean's mother. It was a pleasure that to do anything for us gentlemen, although he was a Jerry, he was a gentleman. But he didn't sit down when I took him in, till I told him. And after all, he was somebody's son. From the McLean's house, Hess is taken to the Home Guard barracks in Busby, Scotland, to await the arrival of the Glasgow police. His only interest continues to be a meeting with the Duke of Hamilton. The Duke, a wing commander, comes from Turnhouse Airfield near Edinburgh. Hess announces, I am Reichsminister Hess. The Duke does not recall meeting him, returns to his post, flies to London, where Churchill calls the story too fantastic to believe. A diplomat who knew Hess in Berlin, Sir Yvonne Kirkpatrick, goes to take a look. The Duke of Hamilton and Kirkpatrick see Hess here at Buchanan Castle near Loch Lomond, north of Glasgow. Kirkpatrick immediately identifies the prisoner as Rudolf Hess. While the Glasgow record sent the story, the still secret prisoner harangues his visitors all night from copious notes. Hess offers peace, but Churchill must go. Meanwhile, record reporters show David McLean a photograph of Hess whom McLean identifies as the man who parachuted into his field. The story is out. Hess has moved to Aldershot. Churchill, embarrassed that anyone would think he would deal with Hess, secretly sends his Lord Chancellor, Viscount Simon, to pump the prisoner. Hess tells him Britain can rule the seas, Germany can rule Europe. Hess is interviewed daily in this room. In Berlin, Hitler fears Hess will reveal his plan to attack Russia. 
When the attack does come, Hess says wanly, they've done it after all. If he came to prevent a two-front war, he has failed. His British Army psychiatrist, Dr. Henry V. Dix. My very first examination of him made me feel that he was a paranoid schizophrenic. That's to say, uh, a man suffering from a severe and usually irreversible form of insanity. But as I got to know him better, I saw that this was uh, only part of him, that there was a very large part of his personality functioning very adequately, not invaded by his delusions, and that he could, for quite lengthy periods, snap out of his delusional system and uh, either act normally or petulantly or childishly, but certainly not uh, psychotically or insanely. When he was persecuted, then he was very aloof, distant, his eyes were stony, he stared at you, sometimes he sh shouted out at you, you know I'm being poisoned, um, and so on. Uh, he would, um, for example, have to have a food taster. He would not eat alone. He would have to have one of the duty officers eat and usually begin the eating. He would change plates with us if we were all sitting down to a meal uh, so that uh, the plate which was served him would not be the one he would have to eat. And he started reading and quoting um, that kind of masochistic poetry which um, Germans in their more romantic moments are very fond of quoting. Goethe and so on about uh, relentless destiny and how we must all complete our circle. Anyway, we then began to think very seriously of an attempt at suicide. He said he couldn't sleep and would I please come and see him in the middle of the night. For this purpose, the grill the, um, behind which he was had to be opened by the sergeant on duty at the grill and the commissioned duty officer who sat at, outside his door had to step aside, and out he came, rushing at me. I rather felt that he was going to attack me as the um, author of all his poisoning, but instead he pushed me aside, being very much larger than myself, and took a flying leap over the banister of the landing. And uh, landed on um, part of the um, rail and uh, smashed one of his thighs. And that's all the damage he suffered. Maimed of Court Hospital, South Wales. Hess is now more a patient than a prisoner. Sometimes lucid, sometimes not. He develops amnesia. Later, he writes his wife, something pleasant, my memory has returned. But he believes German soldiers are being hypnotized from afar by the Jews. In Germany, Billy Messerschmidt, defending himself for letting Hess take a plane, says, how was I to know one so high in the Reich could be crazy? Whether Rudolf Hess is legally insane will plague the Nuremberg trials to come. The Nuremberg trials, 1945. If Hess is really insane, how can he be tried with his old Nazi colleagues as a war criminal? Confronted with Goering, his former secretaries, some of his oldest friends, most believe him mad. Seven psychiatrists, however, American, British, French, and Russian, Conclude Hess has recovered from a true psychotic episode induced by the ignominious failure of his mission. He is unstable, and he has, doctors say, a culturally conditioned pseudo-paranoia, but is legally sane and can be tried. However, the War Crimes Tribunal must decide if Hess's loss of memory will hinder his ability to defend himself. A chief American prosecutor at Nuremberg, Telford Taylor. Uh, one of the lawyers, one of the other lawyers on the staff assisting Justice Jackson was the late uh, John Harlan Amon, a prominent uh, uh, New York attorney. Uh, Amon got the idea that he would uh, uh, collect a lot of documentary movies of the Nazi period, movies which showed Hess himself, showed him with Hitler, showed him addressing great uh, party rallies, showed him in all kinds of different situations in the period before he flew to England. Uh, and uh, he would bring in Hess uh, with a lot of people, uh, a lot of witnesses there, and. Uh, sit Hess down and show him these movies and, uh, and see if that did anything to restore uh, Hess's memory. Well, I'm afraid it didn't work very well. Uh, these movies were very interesting, and uh, Hess watched them with great interest. And uh, at the end of them, uh, John Holland Amon said to him, well, Hess, do, uh, do you remember anything? Hess said no. 
That was that. Justice Jackson, representing the United States, uh, took this position. Uh, the psychiatrist's report indicated that uh, Hess had refused to allow any uh, narcosis drugs to be administered to him. The psychiatrist had wished uh, to give him various drugs which might either stimulate his memory or enable them to tell better the extent to which he was faking. And Hess had refused to allow these drugs to be administered to him. His uh, uh, amnesia is not of the type that's a complete blotting out of the personality of the type uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, would be fatal to his defense. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we feel that uh, so long as Hess refuses the ordinary, simple expedients, uh, even if his amnesia is genuine, that he is not in a position to continue to assert that he must not be brought to trial. We think this trial should proceed. Before the tribunal had a chance to come to any conclusion about it, uh, uh, Hess himself said he wanted to be heard. Ich habe gleich zu Beginn der Verhandlung meinen Verteidiger einen Zettel He said that uh, he had been feigning, uh, pretending his amnesia, uh, and uh, he wished the tribunal now to know that he was in possession of his faculties, uh, that his concentration was a little disturbed, but that he could remember now, and he wished to take his place with his fellow defendants and to be tried. This is granted. Sir Jeffrey Lawrence, tribunal president, asks each defendant for his plea. The defendant is to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges against them. Rudolf Hess. That will be entered as a plea of not guilty. The prosecution presents a chart of the Nazi organization. An American lawyer explains, the Fuhrer is the supreme and only leader in the Nazi hierarchy. And here he makes a slip. He says, his successor designate was first the defendant Hess, and subsequently the defendant Goering. Both Hess and Goering hear this in the German translation. And uh, Goering, as you may know, was a man of uh, great and enormous vanity. And uh, when he heard this coming over the translation system, that uh, the American lawyer was saying that he was number three and Hess number two, uh, why Goering was immediately uh, uh, very much piqued, and he began waving around and pointing to himself, ich bin die Zweiter, I was the second. And uh, calling everybody's attention to the fact that, that he'd been demoted quite unjustly. Uh, well, uh, while Goering was going through these antics to try to call attention to uh, the true state of uh, affairs, uh, Hess looked over at Goering, who was sitting on his right, and uh, saw what Goering was doing, and then he leaned back and he laughed and laughed and laughed. And uh, this led me, at least, to believe that uh, Hess's amnesia was, in part at least, feigned, and I so expressed the opinion then. Hess seems happy. He writes to his wife, Dearest little mommy, my comrades recognize with joy I am still exactly the same man. But he has stomach cramps, says his guards are poisoning him. Co-defendant Albert Speer says, in German, what a screwball. During Hess's defense, the Nazis fear he will make fools of them. Goering is mocking. Another one asks, this is what Hitler called a political leader? Walter Funk says, seriously, it is not funny. It is disgraceful. They are especially ashamed of Hess's naive personal offer of peace to Britain, of which he is most proud. Hess asked to make a final statement before the verdict. Einige meiner Kameraden hier können bestätigen, dass ich bereits zu Beginn des Prozesses... A large part of this uh, last statement of his, which uh, was about, oh, 20 minutes long, was very rambling and inarticulate, and had to do with... Uh, uh, how there are a lot of people around him while he was in prison in England who had glassy eyes and stared at him in a strange way. And much of what he said, uh, as I say, is incoherent and, uh, and uh, suggestive of profound abnormality in his mind. Uh, but after the court had said, you've been talking for 20 minutes and uh, time's running out, he then said at the end, uh, I was permitted to work for many years of my life under the greatest son whom my people has brought forth in its thousand-year history, meaning Hitler. Even if I could, I would not want to erase this period of time from my existence. I am happy to know that I have done my duty to my people, my duty as a German, as a National Socialist, as a loyal follower of my Fuhrer. I do not regret anything. It is October 1st, 1946, the Day of Judgment. 
Hess will leave the court, strut to his cell, laugh, and say he did not hear the verdict and does not care what the sentence will be. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Hess served that life sentence in Spandau Prison in Germany. His late years clouded in mystery and speculation. There were some who claimed that the mad old man, for years the only Nazi prisoner left in the prison, was not really Hess at all. Some advanced the theory that Hess never made it to England, that an imposter took his place, and that the imposter may have been a Soviet KGB agent attempting to find out whether the British were planning to turn against the Soviet Union in an alliance with the Nazis. The strange case of Rudolf Hess will most likely never be fully explained or understood. Now let us meet some other Germans, those opposed to Adolf Hitler, those who plotted to kill him. The plots against Hitler involve a very few. Not these people, the overwhelming majority who fanatically support him, but a fragment, one-tenth of one percent of 80 million Germans who do not and will actively rebel. Those sickened by Nazi murder and tyranny, and those who feel that Hitler is wrecking Germany. The odds against these plotters are enormous. The prime target, Hitler, has a personal bodyguard of 1,000 quick-triggered army and SS men. In public, he wears a bulletproof vest, a cap lined with three and a half pounds of steel. His heavily escorted personal plane is armor-plated with an ejection compartment for parachute descent. Yet a few men with differing backgrounds, specks in these huge, adoring crowds, are joined together in a resistance movement against Hitler. Their courier is Hans Gazavius, ex-Gestapo man, informant of Alan Dulles in Switzerland. Their members include aristocrats and intellectuals like Count Helmut von Moltke, Adam von trotz Zuzotz, Rhodes Scholar and Foreign Affairs expert, Dr. Eugen Gerstenmeier, prominent Protestant layman, a leader of the young idealistic opposition, and Ulrich von Hassel, diplomat dismissed by Hitler as German ambassador to Italy. There are politicians, Karl Gerdler, conservative leader of this faction, former mayor of Leipzig. Julius Lieber, former Reichstag member, social democrat, leader of the left-wing opposition. And Wilhelm Leuschner, trade unionist and anti-Nazi before 1933. And there are military men, Ludwig Beck, retired general who rebels after the rape of Czechoslovakia. Erwin von Witzleben, field marshal, who joins for the same reason. Henning von Tresco, active general, resistance head on the Eastern Front, and four younger officers who will try to kill Hitler. Fabian von Schlabendorf, Colonel Freiherr von Gersdorf, Captain Axel von dem Busch, and Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, who will place a bomb at Hitler's feet. November 8, 1939, the Munich Beer Hall. Ironically, the first attempt to kill Hitler is an apparent fraud, like the Reichstag fire, rigged by the Nazis themselves to discredit opposition and well public opinion behind the Fuhrer early in the war. Hitler is making his annual party speech commemorating the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch. And behind Hitler, hidden in a swastika-covered column, is a bomb put there by Georg Elzer, a German communist carpenter just released from Dachau concentration camp. After delivering an unusually short speech, Hitler hurriedly leaves the hall. CBS News correspondent Daniel Schor questions one who remained, German broadcasting technician Albert Eckebrecht. Were you surprised at Hitler's sudden departure? Yeah, ja, es hat uns überrascht. Und da habe ich mit uh, Diplom-Ingenieur Schachtert vom Reichshauterzug darüber gesprochen. Und yes, we were surprised. I discussed it with one of the engineers, and he told me, yes, it's true. He had to leave because he had an important meeting with someone. There was a special train waiting for him in the main station. Well, as I came down to take things apart, the column, I stood at the right of the speaker's platform, started taking the microphone apart. And suddenly something fell on my head. It is funny, but I did not hear any explosion. I thought somebody had let something drop from upstairs. But when I looked up, I saw that the chandelier and the ceiling and everything was coming down. It must have been a pretty powerful explosion, since the whole building came tumbling down. 
At the funeral for the seven dead, Hitler vows revenge. Elzer is arrested, confesses, but strangely the Gestapo will wait until 1945 to murder him. Whether he was an idealist or Nazi tool is still not known. Even as Hitler marches in triumph, resistance continues inside Germany. The Kreisau Circle, named after von Moltke's estate, is an illegal discussion group secretly planning for a post-war democratic Germany. One of its leaders, Dr. Eugen Gerstenmeier. We were young men, socialists, Prussian aristocrats, young clergymen, Catholics, Protestants, workers, and we did not command any armies. We wanted to work on the idea that the generals should finally decide to do something. We just wanted to tell them, you must first kill Hitler, even at the price of unconditional surrender later to the English, the French, the Russians, the Americans. And with the risk that things might go wrong and you would then be hanged. But you have to undertake this risk. The risk is taken by an army resistance group on March 13, 1943. Adolf Hitler is at Smolensk on the Eastern Front. He is about to fly to his headquarters at Rostenburg. A junior officer, pre-war lawyer, Fabian von Schlabrendorf, has a package for the Führer's plane. Two bottles of Quattro, he says, gift for a friend at headquarters. He asks a colonel on Hitler's staff, Heinz Brandt, if he will take the bottles with him. Brandt agrees. At the airport, Schlabrendorf hands Brandt the package. Before doing so, he reaches inside, breaking a glass capsule. What appears to be two Quattro bottles is an explosive packet with two captured British bombs, supplied by plotters and German military counterintelligence. The broken capsule now releases acid, which is eating away a wire, which will release a striker, which will hit a detonator and set off the bombs 30 minutes after takeoff when Hitler is over Minsk. The half hour passes. An hour. Two hours. Hitler lands safely at Rostenburg, the bombs unexploded and undiscovered. Now Schlabrendorf must get them back or they will be delivered to the friend who is not in on the plot. He phones Brandt, tells him there's been a mistake, hold the bottles. Then he flies to Rostenburg to retrieve the package. Schlabrendorf will now board the night train for Berlin. In his locked compartment, he dismantles the bombs. The acid has eaten away the wire, the striker has hit forward, but the detonator, so carefully tested beforehand, has not gone off. The plot has failed. The Eden Hotel, Berlin, eight days later. Schlabrendorf gives two bombs to Colonel Freiherr von Gerstorff, who will take them to the Berlin arsenal where Hitler is appearing on Heroes Memorial Day. Gerstorff, bombs in his pockets, will get as close as possible to Hitler and blow up the Fuhrer and himself. Hitler is scheduled to stay for 30 minutes. The bombs have 10-minute fuses, but because of the intense cold, it will take 15 to 20 minutes for them to explode. Time enough. Timing the event by radio in Smolensk is General Henning von Fresco, a leading army plotter. Suddenly, after only eight minutes, Hitler leaves the hall. Gersdorf does not even have time to break the acid capsule. Another plot has failed. Hitler appeared to lead a charmed life as plot after plot against him fizzled. But by 1944, the charm began to tarnish. The war was now going against Hitler, and the anti-Nazi underground had a plan. For Adolf Hitler, the days of conquest and glory are over. Germans who once goose-stepped through Europe are now prisoners shuffling through Moscow. The Russian front is crumbling. Allied bombers are smashing Germany. And inside Germany, the resistance movement, the anti-Nazi underground, so long frustrated, is now ready for the supreme plot to kill Hitler. This man will try it. Count Klaus von Stauffenberg, 36, a colonel on the general staff, badly wounded in Tunisia. A brilliant, urbane officer, an aristocrat, a Catholic, he is sickened in 1938 by Hitler's treatment of the Jews and by Nazi brutality, and joins the resistance. With his crippling wounds, he is unlikely to be suspected as a possible assassin, even by his wife, Countess Nina von Stauffenberg, the reporter, Daniel Shore. He lost um, his right hand and uh, the two fingers of his left and his left eye and was uh, lying for quite a while in the hospital. There was a rather touching moment one morning. I came to him and uh, found him in a uh, 
rather thoughtful, do you say thoughtful mood, and saying, uh, I think it's time that I rescue Germany. And I said, oh, you're just, a, just in the state, you just look, look the like of it. And uh, so because I thought he was in a black mood and, and want to um, take, make a joke out of it. And he said, no, you see, everyone is responsible for what is going on. And especially, uh, and I feel especially as an officer, as an G staff officer, it is, uh, it's just as uh, where I feel myself responsible to uh, save my country. He had had an operation and he was really very, very uh, down. And then he had to recover and had to get used to this, uh, to, to, to live with three fingers. But he succeeded very well. And when he came back from Berlin, he came by Bamberg. And when he came there, it was the first, really one of the first things I, I said to him, I said, you are plotting. And he said, why, oh, how, oh, where did you know, why did you know, or where did you know from? And I said, oh, I just feel it. What did he then tell you about the plots? Oh, only that it was planned, but not much details, because he always said, the less you know, the better it's for you, because he always uh, reckoned with a um, possibility that I one time was to to be questioned, and so if I didn't know names, I couldn't tell, couldn't tell them, you see. But you knew that it was a plot to kill Hitler. Yes, but I didn't. Uh, he never told me that it, he, it was he himself to do it, which was in the beginning. It wasn't planned. It was only in the end, and he, he'd never told me that it was he himself to do it. Berlin, July 19th, 1944, 8 p.m. Klaus von Stauffenberg leaves military headquarters, the Bendlerstrasse, and drives through the heavily bombed city toward his house in the western suburb of Wannsee. He has been summoned to Hitler's headquarters the next day to make a report on the replacement army, feverishly being built for the Eastern Front. Twice before he has been called by Hitler, twice he has carried bombs, twice the plots have failed. Tomorrow's plot, linked to an army revolt in Berlin, codenamed Valkyrie, may be his last chance. He stops at the Catholic Church at Dahlem to pray. The act he is planning, tyrannicide, the act of killing a tyrant, poses deep religious questions. He has discussed them with the Bishop of Berlin, who does not try to restrain him on theological grounds. Of his determination to kill Hitler, Stauffenberg says to a friend, we have examined ourselves before God and our consciences. It has to happen, for this man is evil itself. July 20th, 6 a.m., Stauffenberg's house. His staff car is waiting. Inside, Stauffenberg is packing his briefcase, which hides an English plastic bomb provided by plotters and German military counterintelligence. He also carries a pair of tongs with which he can break the bomb's glass capsule, releasing acid, which eats away a wire, freeing a striker, detonating the explosive. As he leaves his house, he orders his driver to pick up Lieutenant Werner von Heften, his adjutant. Stauffenberg is worried about the tongs. He has practiced manipulating them for hours with his one three-fingered hand. The drive through Berlin is quiet. They do not talk in front of the driver. Bronxdorf Airport, 7 a.m. Their Heinkel is airborne. The flight to Hitler's headquarters will take three hours. In 1963, this reporter visited Hitler's headquarters at Rostenburg, East Prussia, now Poland, the scene of this major attempt upon Hitler's life to trace the events of that fateful day. This was our report of what took place there on that July 20th in 1944. We pick up the story with Stauffenberg's arrival. Stauffenberg arrives at Rostenburg shortly after 10 a.m. He tells his pilot to be ready for an immediate takeoff any time after 12 noon. He hurries over here to Hitler's headquarters, the Wolfschatze, the Wolf's Lair. At noon, he is conferring with Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel in Keitel's quarters. Keitel tells him that Hitler has moved up his conference from 1 p.m. to 12.30 p.m. because Benito Mussolini is expected in the early afternoon to visit headquarters and Hitler has to be free to receive him. The conference will be held in the open-windowed barracks today, not in the sealed underground bunker. They will assemble around a heavy oak briefing table. Shortly before 12.30, Keitel and Stauffenberg leave Keitel's quarters to visit Hitler. 
Stauffenberg says that he's left his cap and his belt behind. He returns to the quarters. He opens the briefcase with the bomb, breaks the capsule with tongs, and rejoins Keitel, the briefcase under his arm. In 10 minutes, the bomb will go off. During General Adolf Heusinger's briefing, Stauffenberg puts the briefcase on the floor near Hitler, then slips out to take a phone call. A Colonel, Heinz Brandt, kicks the briefcase twice, it's in his way, then moves it to the far side of the plank table leg, away from Hitler. After Stauffenberg slips from the conference room, he hurries to the headquarters of General Erich Feldgiebel, one of the plotters. Outside of Feldgiebel's bunker, the two officers watch and wait. At 12.42 p.m., the bunker explodes with a tremendous roar. It was as if, Stauffenberg said later, a 155-millimeter shell had hit it directly. Stauffenberg is certain that no one will survive the explosion. Four are dead, but not Hitler. Had the briefcase not been moved, had the conference been held in the underground bunker instead of an open-windowed, flimsy barracks which dissipated the explosion, Hitler almost certainly would not have survived. Felgebel will phone the news to Berlin. Now Stauffenberg must rush back to his plane and get back to the capital. He manages to get past the headquarters security guard and reaches the airport. Shortly after 1 p.m., he is airborne. During the next three hours, as Stauffenberg's Heinkel lumbers toward Berlin, history will be made and the plot will be lost. At 4 p.m., Hitler, his right ear deafened, his right arm temporarily paralyzed, meets Mussolini's train. Hitler's guards at first blame the explosion on a sneak enemy bomber, then on foreign worker sabotage. Now they are asking about the one-eyed colonel who left so quickly. Fifteen minutes before, Stauffenberg has landed in Berlin. 3.45 p.m., Stauffenberg lands, learns by telephone nothing has been done to carry out the coup d'etat. The plotters still wait for word. Is Hitler dead or alive? He's dead, shouts Stauffenberg, and races into Berlin. Stauffenberg arrives here at the Benderstrasse, military headquarters in Berlin, at 4.30 p.m. He hurries through this entrance. He has done his job brilliantly. But instead of triumph, he finds here chaos, indecision, and the final tragedy. Minutes before, the word has come from Keitel. Hitler is alive. Stauffenberg will not believe it. He galvanizes the plotters into action. Their military chief, General Ludwig Beck, arrives hours late on this critical day. General Friedrich Ulbricht, chief of staff of the Home Army, calls out troops hours late. General Friedrich Frum, his superior, will cooperate only if Hitler is dead. The plotters arrest him. Troops are pouring into Berlin, told Hitler is dead, told there has been an SS putsch, and they must protect state security. Commanding a key battalion is an ambitious, decorated officer, Major Otto Raymer. His orders are to arrest propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, highest ranking official in the city. But Goebbels is tipped off. When Raymer arrives, Goebbels places a blitz call to Hitler to prove that the Fuhrer is alive. Within minutes, Hitler is on the line. He orders Raymer to follow only Goebbels' orders to crush the rebellion. He promotes him from major to colonel on the telephone. Raymer instantly turns his battalion against the plotters, whose failure to assign someone reliable to capture Goebbels, failure to cut all telephone service, and failure to seize as planned the German radio will prove fatal. At 6.30 p.m., a bulletin. Hitler is alive. He will broadcast later in the evening. Now the final hours as the Nazis crush the resistance. The plotters are themselves arrested. Field Marshal Erwin von Witzleben. General Erich Heppner. Four officers are sentenced to death by General Frum, now back in power. Among them is Colonel Merz von Quernheim. Stauffenberg is wounded in the arm, trying to resist. Bleeding badly, he is brought downstairs. Here in this courtyard, on this spot, where this plaque now commemorates their heroism, Count Klaus, Philip, Schenk, von Salfenberg, and three other plotters, General Friedrich Ulbricht, Colonel Merz von Quernheim, and Lieutenant Werner von Heften were executed. Upstairs, General Ludwig Beck was finally killed by a sergeant after only wounding himself in two suicide attempts. The time was shortly after 11 p.m., July 20th, 1944. An army firing squad in the lights of a car shining on the four men did the job. 5,000 more were to die before the bloodbath was over. Stauffenberg's last cry on that night, long live our blessed Germany.
After July 20th in Tago Prison, those plotters who survive are subjected to all of the inhumanities of an aroused Gestapo. Himmler calls it sharpened interrogation. Everyone in Germany with the name Stauffenberg is arrested. Remote cousins, even babies, taken from their mothers and given to strangers. Arrested, too, charged with cowardice, is General Friedrich Fromm, the executioner, now doomed himself. Berlin, the People's Court, August 1944. The first resistance trials begin. Hitler orders them filmed and shown to troops and civilians as a warning. Technicians plead with the presiding judge, Roland Freisler, not to shout. They cannot record the sound properly. Freisler, ex-Bolshevik, admirer of Vyshinsky, is a rabid Nazi. The Gestapo has done everything to break the defendants. Once proud Field Marshal Erwin von Witzleben has his false teeth taken from him, is not permitted to wear belt or suspenders. <laughs> Karl Gerdler, who would have been head of state, had the resistance succeeded. He was once mayor of Leipzig. Ulrich von Hassel, resistance foreign affairs advisor. Hitler had dismissed him as German ambassador to Italy. Adam von Trotzusolz, member of the intellectual Kreisau circle, once a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Count Schwerin von Schwanenfeld, liaison between the military and civilians in the resistance, former aide to Pitzleben. He dares to mention Nazi murders in Poland. General Erich Hefner, a brilliant tank commander sacked by Hitler after the battle for Moscow. The verdict is as expected, death for all. During subsequent trials in 1945, a bomb from an American plane scores a direct hit on the courtroom, killing Judge Freisler, destroying his records, and saving a few yet untried plotters. Those sentenced are executed at Plotzensee Prison, Berlin. Daniel Shore. I want them to be hung up, said Hitler, like carcasses of meat. And so they were, here in Berlin's Plotzensee Prison. The first eight on August 8th, 1944. Stripped to the waist, strangled in slow agony with piano wire, and then strung up on these meat hooks. And then there were more, many, many more, until the death roll numbered 5,000. Hitler ordered the executions filmed to be screened the same night for his private enjoyment. Sickened cameramen had to be constantly replaced until finally they refused to work altogether. Goebbels ordered the film shown to the troops as a warning, but they refused to look. This film cannot be shown today. What was the lesson of July 20th? Had the plotter succeeded in killing Hitler, the war in Europe might have been shortened by nine months. But the conspirators might have confronted civil war and the onrushing allies refusing to accept anything except unconditional surrender. At least, say some of the survivors, at least the division of Germany would have been averted. But even that is not sure. The failure of the plotters was brighter than their success might have been. And for the young generation of Germans who make this their national shrine, it provides one twinge of pride to offset the memory of Dachau and Auschwitz. Because of these plotters, today's Germans learn that it is a virtue to disobey evil. Plotters whose names few now remember, and the others, Goering, Goebbels, Hess, 
all played out their roles in the massive, murderous drama of World War II. There were other villains and a lot of heroes, and we will continue to chronicle the people and the events of this terrible time in history for the CBS Video Library of World War II. I'm Walter Cronkite. Thank you.